So I'm going to be quiet for a little while. Just joking. Um, I haven't really thought about this. Uh, maybe you asked me uh, a few weeks ago what the theme was, and I hadn't really thought about it until this morning. But I do think about the idea of silence all the time. And you all probably do too, because of your creative person. One of the things that I found when I became an artist was that when you're making the work that you're doing, you're totally present. And when you're totally present, it is really silent because when I'm in my studio making my artwork, I am just with the work and it seems like everything else around me disappears. So it, it is feeling like it is silent even though I am making an action of, say, in this case, painting on a canvas, but there's nothing between me and the canvas. It is just me and the canvas, and the rest of the world is just somewhere else. Now, when I'm doing this, just for information, because I told her, was that I actually have music in the background. The reason that I have music in the background was that uh, when I was a kid, I used to draw and have rock and roll radio station on. This was back in the early 60s. So and music has been a kind of a comfort zone for me. So, But what it also does for me even now is that it blocks out the rest of the world. But once I start getting into the work, even that disappears. I don't even really listening to the music. It is like a filter. So as a result, I am uh, in the moment and present and silent. I mean, I'm not even thinking, it's almost like you give yourself to the work and you're just in that zone, as some people refer to. Um, so for me, it is one of the things I enjoy being an artist is being in my studio. Now, one of the problems I have as an individual is I'm also a social being. <laughs> so if I wasn't, I wouldn't be here. So one of the things I also do as, being, as well as being an artist is being a curator. And being a curator is I organize exhibitions of other artists' work. I come up with an idea and then look for artists who kind of in a sense support that idea. That, in, in doing so, one of the first steps is to, again, go into your thoughts, be present, and think, which means you are thinking but it's thinking about what you really want to do with this exhibition that you're organizing. So for me, it's what happens is with curating, <clears throat> as I told other people before, is that I go out and look at artists' work. I get able to have discussions, conversations with about their ideas, about their processes. And in turn, I'm, I learn from that as an individual and as an artist. And what it does for me is like I'm breathing in information and when I'm in my studio, it's like I'm breathing out. It's all the stuff that I've experienced throughout the days is it's like it's coming out in the work. But one of, uh, there was an artist who, uh, whose work I like, like a lot uh, by the name of Jasper Johns. And one of the things that 
he talked about is sometimes when you have, when you're doing your work, sometimes there are things that you cannot prevent from spilling out into the work that are part of yourself. And I think that is the part that makes it the art is where you're not consciously making decisions, but unconsciously making decisions. And, and then as a result, part of you gets into the work. Now, does that happen all the time? Not necessarily, but you have to be present. A lot of times in making my work, I have an idea, I go about doing the idea, I build the canvas, the stretcher, start painting. In a sense, I get to a point where the idea is illustrated. It's got all the imagery that I want, it's got the, the coloration that I'm wanting, but it seems like now at that point is where uh, it's really the gate into the unknown. And it's being able to go past that, and that's the difficult part, and that's why it goes back to being present and being silent and just get into the work. And that's not easy to do. I think it's easier for me to do now because I've been being an artist for now 45 years and I'm able to get into that zone easier, but that doesn't mean that what I'm doing is necessarily as successful as I might want it to be. But also one of the things I think is important is to allow for um, For experiment, for experimenting in like, well, okay, well, you know, I have it this far, how about if I push it and push it? Now, I'm not thinking about these things, it's just like, you're just kind of uh, using your intuition. A lot of times intuition gets uh, a bad rap, but I think it's an integral part of being an artist. It's, you, you know when it's done, and you, and you, cannot get there thinking about it. You just like, oh, it's done. It's like, it's perfect, that's it. I can't do anything more. And when it isn't there, I'm always thinking about the work. I've actually go back into some of my older works or even recent works that I've finished and thinking, you know, it needs to be pushed further. But it's like, and I think about it, but once I start thinking about it, it's like I start setting up the scenario of like what I wanna do when I get back into the studio and start reworking it and, and trying again, get to that point where you just like lose consciousness of the world around you. Uh, so there are two ways that, that I, as I mentioned, think about this, one where I'm, when I'm as curator thinking about what I wanna do, but by doing that, you have to be present. I think this is one of the hardest things that I've had to, in a sense, acknowledge. When I was a kid drawing, I was I was very present. I mean, I was like, you know, piece of paper in front of me, got pencils or whatever, and just drawing, and you're just like really enjoying it. And as you get older, you'll get distracted by a lot of different things, including technology. Technology is getting to be the biggest distraction for me. Uh, I don't do I don't do social media. Uh, I, I hear all the things that happen that are really great about social media, but I also hear all the bad things that happens with social media. I, I and I understand people say, well, you should do this. It'll help you with your work and all this. And it's like, in the end, the work that I do, I really am doing it for myself. I don't do it for other people. As an artist, it's, I mean, one of the reasons I have a job at UTA where I'm a professor and director of the gallery at UTA, I, I do that so I can be my studio and not be burdened with the, the art as commodity because it is a commodity too and I have to deal with that part of it. But I try to remove that when I'm in the studio. Uh, my wife and I talk about, my wife Janet Chafe, who's also an artist, uh, we have these discussions about, you know, what's in the galleries, why the certain works get into galleries and certain galleries and why other works doesn't. We have all those discussions all the time. Um, I, in the end, it's like I told her that being an artist for me, the best part is actually just being in the studio making the work. 
for other people is the acknowledgement from external sources about your work. I've been fortunate that I've gotten some acknowledgements from the outside, from the art community, but that is not what drives me. That's what encourages me, but it doesn't drive me. What drives me is just being in the studio, being present. And, and as in the last several years, it seems to be getting harder to be able to do that. One of the things that, um, um, my wife has three kids, we now have like eight grandkids, and at a certain point years ago, they started texting and texted to Janet, and then she had to learn how to text, and then she said, you need to learn how to text, and now I'm actually a better texter than her. <laughs> but the problem is, is like if we're at home and we're eating or we're doing something and our phones are nearby, if she gets a text, the first thing is she wants to do is do this and you know, read the text. And when I don't do that, because I don't do that, because if it was an emergency, somebody's gonna call me, they're not gonna text me. So I don't pick it up as fast as she does and she gets upset by that. She says, somebody's trying to contact you. I, I, I see that. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll look at it in a little while and, and get back to them. You know, it's like, again, it's not an emergency. There's no reason for me to have to be a slave to that little thing, which I have in my back pocket right now. So I think those kinds of things, um, as our culture uh, matures, there's more and more um, distractions. And I say distractions, not necessarily that they're all bad. Um, I love, as I mentioned, I love music. I, when I was in undergraduate school, I actually booked concerts for the University of Houston. I was a stage chan for five years and did concert posters for that amount of time. And that's how I paid my way through school. So uh, I, I really enjoy music. So I like to go to concerts probably quite often. I like to listen to music and I like to listen to new music. I find friends of mine who I went to school with like to listen to what they call classic rock. I love classic rock, I grew up with it, saw a lot of bands, um, but I like new music too. I like to hear what's happening right now. And sometimes even when I don't like something, I wanna hear it because it's like it may be something that's popular or trending and it's like I wanna know what it's about. Because I wanna be tied to the present. And the present means the present time. I'm not a nostalgic person. Uh, I like quality, I mean, if um, liking artists like Picasso, Velasquez, Monet, um, those artists, I think that that's really quality work. And there's more and more artists. I could you know, be here for hours just um, going off on the names. But I'd also like to know what's going on now. Not because, not because I wanna know what's hot, but I wanna know what other people are thinking. Art to me is about ideas. And some people say, well, aren't you like, you know, you, don't you wanna have a show here, do that? And said, yes, I'm very kind of ambitious and competitive in that manner. But I think the real competition in art is with myself. It's not with other artists. I don't, I don't think of other artists as being competition to me. We're all in the same, boat, so to speak, in the sense that we're trying to work out new ideas and we don't know that they're even new. We're experimenting, playing with our work. And I, and I want to use the word play because I think uh, that gets forgotten sometimes. There is, um, you know, we work, I play. <laughs> so that's what I do in my studio. I like to play. And it is a form of work. And it is a form that one that uh, compels me to do other kinds of works that I don't not necessarily crazy about, like uh, that works that are more clerical in the sense of making sure like I get images photographed and cataloged and all that. And it's a lot of work. And then when you have 45 years of work, it's like as another, um, as a musician, Neil Young refers to it, it's like a, 
a heavy overcoat that weighs you down from keeping doing new things. So it is, it is a burden having that history because also having that history also means that your, your people will refer to that work and sometimes and kind of tie you down to it as opposed to letting you still continue to grow. I think one of the things I like doing is, is growing as an artist continually, trying to push uh, my own boundaries. And then with my wife, uh, we also do collaborative work. And it's a matter of, in that case, it be, silence becomes much more difficult because you have two people working together. And sometimes when you're working together, it's great. And then when it's not great, it's a problem. <laughs> So, but that's the thing, what I like about it is that it's like, okay, how do we, we resolve this? One of the interesting things that happened a few years ago, we had, uh, we were asked by the National Sculpture Center to create a work for a fundraiser. And it was, they asked three cu couples to do collaborative work. And Jen and I actually were creating a work that was based on the roof or the ceiling of the Nasher. If you're familiar, there's been a big controversy about the Nasher Sculpture Center and the museum tower next door, where the Nasher, the Renzo Piano, the architect, created these portals that face kind of north east. And before the museum tower, it allowed for indirect light to come into the galleries. But because the museum tower now has kind of this mirror finished facade, the, the sun at certain times of day hits the, the wall of the tower and comes back down and goes through those portals. And then you see this kind of gridded system on the walls and floor of the museum as well as the art. Now, what we did was we took the negative space, which is based on a sine curve, which is a one by two ratio, which I found out is a ratio that, the sign curve is a ratio that Renzo Piano used throughout the museum as far as the architecture. But we decided to use the negative space as the, the idea for creating an object, which we made out of hydrocal. So we had to create a model and then make a cast and then make the actual model from that. Well, at one point in doing so, we were, I had not done this in years as far as making a mold. And we we're doing a silicone mold and we pour in it and there's two halves and then we pour the hydrocal into it as in liquid form. And right before we did that, and the process was already happening, my wife and I had a big argument. I mean, it happens in relationships. If it doesn't, you're maybe really not talking to each other. <laughs> but what was interesting, we both had to hold the mold, which was about, about this high, and there are two parts, and it was about this big a diameter. And we were holding it, and we were not talking. We were not really silent, but we were not talking. But during that time, by doing this, by collaborating, literally collaborating on this particular part, we became very present. And we actually saw each other and acknowledged each other and were able to get over the argument. And it was the work itself, again, that allowed us to do that, to overcome that obstacle of what we were arguing about. Now I don't even know what we're arguing about now. But there was a point where it's like there was silence between us, but we were in community with each other, creating a piece, and we thought this is important because we both want to do this, and we, in order to make this happen, we have to work together. And it was a good lesson for both of us. And um, we're, we're supposed to have another show in Fort Worth uh, next year, and I'm hoping that we don't have those big arguments <laughs> in creating more work for the show. But again, I think silence kind of comes in, in kind of different forms, you know? But for me, the purest one is when you are making the work and then there's nothing uh, in the world. The world doesn't exist. Uh, do, as again, you know, I've heard about Inspire. 
One of the other things I've talked to my wife about, because she's just a few years younger than me, but she's many years younger than me as far as her art career. And one of the things I said to her, because she really does, you know, she feels some the success of her work is based on external factors. And one of the things I said is like, what I learned is that there's gonna be people who are gonna like your work, there's gonna be people who are not gonna like the work, and there's gonna be a lot of people who don't, are not gonna care about your work. And for me, if somebody comes out and just says, you know, I like, I really like your work, whether they're just saying something that's a very compliment and they, it really relates to them, or they're actually buying a work, which is a very nice compliment. But that encourages me to continue, but it will not stop me if I don't hear that because I have to listen to my own voice and, and follow my own path. And that's a difficult thing to do. Um, I assume many of you know that. Uh, and even now I still, you know, I still wanna try new things. And in, and in trying new things, you also have to allow yourself to fail. That's what kind of gets you, you learn from that and you kind of push it. And that's why I'm even more critical of my own work nowadays than I was even earlier. And when I, in my earlier work, when I was still in school and getting out of school, it was, a lot of it was, you know, I was enjoying having a really great time. But, you know, every time I, I did a, a work that kind of, for me, raised the stakes of like where I was as an artist, and I felt like, oh, I just did something that's better than whatever, anything that I've done before. And then it's like, how do, you, how do you get to that? Because when you get to that, there's a sense of, for me, it was this kind of a sense of accomplishment and euphoria. And, and I was really happy. I was like, I did a portrait of my father in graduate school and I, it was like the biggest milestone of my young career at that time. And I knew, and, it was, and I was like happy for a week. I was like, wow, I, I just did something that I had never done before. And I'm just not talking about just making a portrait, but doing something that was beyond just an illustration. And it was something that was like, in this, in this case, it was, it, was like, it was him in this painting. So it's like, how do you replicate that? Well, you really can't replicate it. You can't set up the same ingredients. It just, it just happens. But what I found is that early on, your accomplishments are like the valleys and highs are really extreme. And as you get older and the more you do it, those valleys and highs get uh, more, uh, less, have less depth and there's more consistency of doing good work but you still wanna do better work and it's like you're still trying to push. Now, one of the things I found in reading years ago and talked with other artists was that we sometimes criticize older artists like me, <laughs> my age, uh, because sometimes artists end up look like they're repeating themselves. They kind of like, oh, they found the formula and they're just, but I actually think that in the end, is of that artist is trying to really push their work. And even though they might, is the integrity with which they're working in, is that still true and important? So are they still trying to push their work? And even though they might not be able to push it as much as they used to, they're still trying. And I, I applaud that. And I think that's an important distinction to make because there are artists out there who, in my opinion, and they, they found the formula and they've, they found some success and they uh, are kind of in a sense milking it. So for me, it's, it's like, how do you push that? How do you push the work? And it's always having to go back inside yourself and focus and get to that place where silence becomes important and, and when the silence happens, it's been, you're in the zone for me. And I am in, in a state where something is happening and I really like what's happening and I enjoy what I'm doing. But again, it's, it's like, it's all like intuitive. 
And that's, that's a really difficult place to get to, considering all the distractions, everything that goes around you. Um, as we were talking about earlier, maybe and I, where it's like you have so many things pulling at you to keep you from doing what you wanna do. It's a lot of discipline for me to be an artist. It's one thing to be a curator because I'm also relying on other people and by working with other people, it makes me do my job. But there's nobody in my studio saying, you need to keep working for another couple of hours to finish that work. It's me having to do that. And that's difficult. And not all artists have the best discipline. They have various disciplines. Some artists will work maybe a few hours a day. Some artists would like to work all day. Uh, some artists like to work early in the morning and then do other things. And s some people like to work in the night when it's quiet. Uh, when I lived in Houston, before I moved up here to work at UTA, um, I worked in mostly in the afternoons and I worked and I would go and visit friends, have a little bit of a social life, come back and work for um, till about maybe anywhere between one and three o'clock in the morning because it was quiet. I really, and nobody was calling me. Nobody, at that time we had landlines. So, but that ring was loud and I had a fax machine. Uh, and um, so, but even then it was like, that's not important, you know. I really wanted to be focused in my studio. So, um, I'm told that we can open up for questions and answers and that might be even better at this point because otherwise I'm gonna repeat myself and, and then I realize I might have no integrity. that you tap into your intuition? To, um, well, I think one of the first things people have to acknowledge is they have, in, they have intuition. Everybody has intuition. I think you have that from the time you're a little kid. You, as a kid, know when things are right or wrong. And it's, it's all intuitive. Um, There were times that, you know, something happened to my sister one time and I thought something was wrong. And I was about eight or nine years old. And I thought, she's not acting the same. And so I didn't know what happened. I don't know anything. And, but I knew she was different and I couldn't tell you what it was. And then I found out in, later in my 20s that she was molested. And she never told the family until later. But kids know those kinds of things. And those are the kinds of things we all have. We have intuition. What sometimes happens is that we start not trusting our intuition. And that's the problem a lot of times. And for me as an artist, it's like I have to trust that and I have to um, allow it to speak to me and for me to listen to it. And that's also, you know, where silence comes in. You have to kind of like, you know, um, filter everything else out and say, oh, my intuition is this is the thing to do or this is the not thing to do. So I think that you, everybody makes decisions and sometimes when I overthink things, I've, I find out later I made the bad decision or a wrong decision. And then sometimes I make really quick decisions and, it's, and the, the older I've gotten, I've learned to trust my intuition and, and I can make decisions quicker now by doing that because I'm like, oh, I just do this because it's now becoming also, uh, that's just become a part of me that's been allowed to have an equal access to my decision making as well as my brain, you know? Because I don't know, it's like, where intuition comes from. I think that's just kind of part of our human nature or part of our nature period, so. But it is difficult because sometimes you're like, oh no, I don't, I don't trust that. Uh, I, you know, I was told that this is what I'm supposed to do or that I should do that. 
and realized later it's like, well, you know, you need to listen to yourself. And for people who are creative, I think intuition is even more important because your work comes out of that as well as your as well as the ideas that you come up with. But at a certain point, intuition comes in in the sense of making decisions of like, is this good? Does this work good or is it not good? And I might not know why something is good. I might have to like when I make a painting and I feel I did something really good. I might not be able to tell you why. I, I attribute to be the idea or the analogy is like when you, as an artist, you learn to do things in, in, in it's like going into a dark room and you kind of like l learn your way around intuitively. And then once you learn everything in the room, you have a good idea, it's like the lights came on and you know where everything is. But for me, it's like, that's, that's what you learn from doing things intuitively. And then I want to go back into another room that, that's dark and start all over because you, you want to keep learning and growing. Um, so. <laughs> I just wondered if you were not curating any books yet. If you're curating anything presently, what's what you're doing? Uh, as, as director of the gallery uh, at UTA, I'm constantly curating for our exhibitions for the, the academic year. And so I also, as a freelance curator, I, I've curated other shows outside the university, and I still do that. Currently, um, putting together a show for January. Well, it's actually, um, our gallery is about 4,000 square feet. Uh, and usually we have like, what I do is two person shows with occasional group shows. And rarely, but at times we do a one person show. Now for the January through February, I'm curating a show of Celia Eberle's work. She's an artist who shows with Chris Worley Gallery in Dallas. She's from Waxahachie. Uh, and I'm pairing her work with uh, Jill Bedgood, who's an artist from Austin. And I've actually known both of the artists probably since the 80s. And I, I even have, um, there was a show that, uh, a group show that Celia and Eber Eberly and I were in, in Houston. And there was a t-shirt made and it was one of her images. I still have the t-shirt. Um, and then Jill Bedgood uh, met through another artist friend of mine uh, back in the, is the late 80s, early 90s. I think it was the late 80s. And I was trying to think of like, who would be good to show with Celia Eberle's work? And Jill Bedgood had a show at uh, ArtScan Gallery in Houston, and my wife and I happened to be down there. And I have family down there, so one of the reasons I also go to Houston uh, still. But I also have a lot of friends, so it turns out she was having an opening. Uh, it was like a um, three-person show in a smaller gallery. And when I saw the work, it was like intuition. It's like, oh, this will work perfectly. And um, so, the reason I say that kind of intuition is like a few days ago before my assistant director of the gallery uh, went on holiday with her family to California, we had to start writing a press release because by the time we get back, school started and we have to kind of get that going. So all of a sudden I had to start thinking about why I selected these two artists and what is it about the work that attracted me to their work. So that's one part of the show. Another part of the show is we have an enclosed gallery um, that's 30, basically 32 by 32. And our gallery for a number of years has, the, the budget for our gallery has not increased in a number of years. Actually, not since I've been there. And so I, I, everything goes up as far as prices. And so one of the other things that came up was I had a discussion with a woman by the name of Margaret Conrads, who was um, in charge of exhibitions at the Emmett Carter a few years ago. And I did a project with the Emmett Carter where I curated works on paper for, show from their collection and their curated, curated works on paper from my studio. And also they had a large scale painting in the atrium gallery for a year and a half. So she moved to uh, 
become director of exhibitions at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. And about a year and a half ago, she was in Houston and wanted to meet with me. And they have a arm of Crystal Bridges called, that's called Art Bridges. And what they want to do, which I think is a really great idea, is create a collection within the collection that could be shared with other institutions around the country. So they asked us if we would be wanted, willing to participate. They would pay for the shipping and they would pay for any um, costs associated with the work as far as conservation uh, and so on and so on. So in order to save money <laughs> and make our budget extend, we said yes and we're borrowing two works from them. There's a Felix Gonzalez Torres uh, piece and a piece from Senga and Naguri, also one piece. But right now we're having a, a, a problem with the humidity factors in the gallery, so we cannot borrow works on paper or paintings at this point or photographs. So at this, what we're doing is supplementing um, with two other artists that are also um, trying to be sure, local. One is Sherry Owens and one is uh, Linda Ridgeway. So each artist will have like a wall. <clears throat> this will be kind of a, sp a sparse installation. It'll be like one work per artist. So I actually, in the case of Linda, it'll be three small works. And Sherry Owens is doing a, a installation, wall installation piece. And then Felix Gonzalez Torres does, uses, um, one of his pieces is a candy piece. <clears throat> and it's wrapped candy in, uh, and it's, usually floor bound and you can d display it in any way. And what we're gonna do is run it along a wall, a 32 foot wall and have it on the floor and come out maybe two to three feet from the wall. And so that will be, and people can actually pick up the candy and take it. So it's an interactive people a piece and it's a piece that, you know, it involves a viewer. Uh, Senga Naguri's piece is actually a, a like an old fan uh, and using pantyhose as stretched, creating a cruciform uh, image that's about <clears throat> probably 10 by 10 feet. <clears throat> so, uh, and then Linda Ridgeway's um, two works on paper in a small sculptural piece dealing with everyday kind of imagery. So. Uh, when is that show? Uh, that opens in uh, January, 21st is the day after Martin Luther King Day, and then the reception is the Friday the 24th, I think. One more question. All right. Awesome. Well, let's give Benito a round of applause. Thank you.